Chapter 6. Foggle. Even though confused, Miller had to be restrained by Azevedo, who made him sit in a chair. The Brazilian military man invited the stranger to sit as well. At least, initially, the stranger refused. Then he questioned the man about what this help he had mentioned would entail and, more importantly, what he had done with his soldiers. The stranger introduced himself only as Fogel, informed Azevedo that the soldiers were fine, and that he shouldn't worry. They were only in a state of suspended animation and would return to consciousness in a few minutes. Regarding the help, he stated that he could disable the spheres if they handed over one of the lunar devices to him after the mission. Wu questioned him. If you have the technology to interfere with objects, why would you need us to reach the moon? Fogel replied. My origin would not be understood by you now. I can say that the civilization I come from has technology similar to what we are observing in this episode. As for whether to trust me or not, I believe you don't have many alternatives at the moment. I am far from home, and I don't have a vehicle capable of traveling into space with me. But fortunately, I still carry this. At that moment, Fogel pulled a silver cubicle object from his pocket and spoke to the group. Allow me to demonstrate. Everyone walked outside the tent, while the man in the black suit headed towards the exclusion zone. Upon entering, the density of the atmosphere, previously visible to the naked eye, completely disappeared. Fogel invited them to find a nearby vehicle. Though reluctant, Wu noticed that birds were now flying over the area freely, which gave them the courage to cross the perimeter. Only Miller refused, sat on a barricade, and said he would wait for them there. Fogel, Azevedo, Pulin, and Wu found a car parked near one of the roads. The vehicle, which theoretically should not have worked, immediately returned to normal when the cube was close. As they approached the sphere, they observed that the object was not yet completely deactivated. It hovered in the air with a small interference zone, perhaps about 1.5 meters in radius. Fogel jumped out of the car and approached the artifact. When he got within about 10 meters of the central position, the object, which had been red before, turned black and fell immediately to the ground, releasing vapor afterward. The other three ran to examine the alien material up close. With all of them facing the alien material, Fogel turned to Azevedo and said, This is why we need to reach the moon. The signal cutoff only occurs in proximity. Chapter 7. Saturn's Moon. After the forced landing, the three crew members put on their protective suits and began assessing the damage. The team consisted of two men and one woman. The ship had few structural damages to the outer hull, but some systems appeared completely destroyed. It didn't take long for the most concerning discovery to become apparent. The time circuit was irreparably damaged. To make matters worse, two-thirds of the supplies were unusable. They searched the historical records for any other missions around the same time so they could contact future control. The response from the onboard computer couldn't have been worse, there were no mission records for the next tens of thousands of years. The situation was terrifying, the biomolecular replacement units could keep them alive for a long time. However, without genetic material from pure humans, sooner or later, the replacement would become obsolete. Moreover, a lot of energy would be spent maintaining the atmosphere and environmental conditions to which their bodies had adapted. After days isolated on that primitive Earth, the ship's commander suggested an unusual approach. Of all the known environments in the solar system, the one that most closely resembled the Earth in the year 3000 was the lower layer of Enceladus's surface, one of Saturn's moons. If the conditions 33,000 years before were the same as those observed in missions to the natural satellite in the future, establishing themselves on Enceladus would be a survival possibility for the three of them. The decision was not unanimous. The third crew member, the time engineer, had doubts about the journey even with the ship repaired. It would be a risky crossing, and they wouldn't have fuel to return if the environment they found wasn't what they expected. He chose to stay, believing he might intercept some ship that also fell through a natural rift, 
perhaps that period in history was some kind of convergence point. He only asked for a demonstration with the date, location, and time of the next missions. He was also left with one of the biomolecular replenishers and a portable AMN with a reduced supply of resources. Thus, the last inhabitant of Svalbard watched the ship containing the commander and co-pilot depart for Enceladus.